All right, so Psalm chapter 12, not a very long psalm, very famous. You know, normally we go to this verse. I, I usually show people Psalm 12 when I'm trying to explain the preservation of God's Word, which you'll find there in verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation and forever. And uh, what I want to preach on this morning, it's not this particular passage, but I'm going to open up with this because these, this is true and this is good. This is a good place if you want to show somebody the preservation of God's Word. But look at what it's saying there. The words of the Lord are pure words. God's Word is pure. God's Word is right. It's truth. And God has preserved His Word. God's Word has not changed over time. You know, the skeptics and the doubters and the haters of God will try to tell you, oh, the Bible's been corrupted, the Bible's been changed, and, you know, how are we even supposed to know what God wants us to know and all this other stuff? And they try to cast doubt. Yea, hath God said. That's Satan's plan from the beginning, is to cast doubt on God's Word. Psalm chapter 12 tells us that God is the one that's in charge of keeping His words. God is an almighty God. God is not restricted or restrained from keeping His words available to us today. Day. Yes, man is imperfect. Yes, if it was completely left up to man alone to preserve God's word, man would probably fail at that. But God is the one that promised that he will preserve his words. It says from this generation forever, God's word remains for us and it is preserved today in the King James Bible. But the reason why I want to point out this specific verse is because it goes along and it fits right in with the whole rest of that passage. God's word has not changed. God's idea of wickedness, about right and what's wrong, has not changed. People try to tell you, oh, that book, that's old-fashioned, that's outdated. People, you know, you believe the Bible? Yeah, well, we're, we're all progressive now. Oh, we live in this brand new society. We're so smart. We're so much farther advanced than those people. They didn't even have indoor plumbing. Ha, ha, ha. That's the, the jokes and the ridicule and the mockings you'll hear about, about people who lived thousands of years ago. As if they were stupid or ignorant and that they didn't know any better. But no, 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 no. We live in such a, a great society and we are so well educated. And we are so well educated, apparently, that this week the Supreme Court ruled that, hey, the Sodomites getting married, no problem. It's fine. And you know what? Quite honestly, I don't have that much of a problem with them getting married, except that I don't think we should be doing anything special for the Sodomites, doing anything to advance their cause because their cause is to destroy the family. But it's the wrong conversation on whether or not they should be married. The conversation should be what should be the punishment for the crime of sodomy. Because the Bible lays out that it's the death penalty. That's the conversation we should be having is, hey, let's put these homos to death. That should be the crime, the punishment for their crime. Not this, oh, well, should we let them marry? What should we let them marry is a moot point if the death penalty is put upon the sin of sodomy as God's word prescribes. God's words are pure words. And are you going to sit there and tell me that God's law is, is inferior to whatever it is that you think just because you live in a world that where you've been brainwashed and you've been, been desensitized to the wicked, vile sin of sodomy? Look at what the rest of this chapter is saying. Let's get it all in context. And the, the title of my sermon is The Wicked Walk on Every Side. That's in verse number 8. Look at the Bible says, The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. When the most wicked, the most corrupt, the most disgusting people, the vile men, when they're exalted in a country or in a nation, among a group of people, when those are the ones that people are exalting and lifted up, the Bible says the wicked walk on every side. Perilous times, my friends, perilous times we live in when our own government is endorsing one of the most vilest things that people can do amongst each other. Let's go back and reread re Psalm 12. It's real short. Let's look at some of these verses. The Bible says, Help, Lord, for the godly man sees it. We need help today. 
the godly people, people who call themselves Christians, now are endorsing this garbage. People are welcoming and accepting and tolerant of the sodomites, of the homosexuals. As if, hey, come on in, we all love you. I don't love them. They're vile. They're wicked. They're reprobate. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceaseth. The godly man is not standing up to this. The faithful fail from among the children of men. Where are the faithful to the Lord? They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. They talk about nothing. The Bible says, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. When the Bible talks about flattering lips and using flattery, it's always associated with somebody who's trying to lay a trap for you. Someone who, in guile, is trying to deceive you for their own gain or for their own purpose. It says, with flattering lips and with a double heart do they speak. A double heart. They're saying things that they don't really mean. Verse 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. And isn't that what we're hearing today? The proud, the gay pride, those that, that have no shame, that will, will go out and proclaim their wickedness to everybody. They'll have a parade about it. And they're proud about the fact that they hate God and that they have sunk so low to the depths of the depravity of man. Who have said, verse 4, with our tongue will we prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Yeah, they're celebrating their victory. And they're so proud about it. But I'll tell you what. They haven't prevailed against God or against His Word or against His pure words that have been around forever and will continue forever. You can't overrule the Bible. The Bible says that the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and He will. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. Psalm 12 finishes up with the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. We're going to see who the vilest men are according to Scripture. Who are these vilest that are exalted? Well, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. And it turns my stomach. You know, I didn't even want to preach on this this morning because I feel like it's been hit on enough, but apparently it hasn't. This country is so disgusting, it turns my stomach to hear the continual news and, the, and the, the constant pounding of the sodomite agenda and the weak Christians who do nothing about it. They think we should be accepting because they've been brainwashed. Here's what your sweet little homosexual sodomite is like. We're going to read in Romans 1 the attributes. Verse number 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. The Bible calls what they do vile. The wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain... This is, look, the homosexuals did not like to retain God in their knowledge according to the Bible. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. God gave up on them. He rejected them because their wicked heart rejected the Lord. Look at the attributes, verse 29. Being filled, completely filled with all unrighteousness, 
This is, you know, they don't want you to know what they're really like. So the media and the, the TVs and the movies, you know, they'll, they'll try to portray the homo, the sodomite, as this friendly person. Oh, he's just a nice guy. Oh, he's just like you and me. He just, you know, his, his preferences are different. His lifestyle is a little different. No, his lifestyle is wicked. It's an abomination and it's vile according to the Bible. They're filled with all unrighteousness. Look at this. Look at this list. This is the list of your precious homo. The gay guy at your work. This is what he's all about. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. Fornication. Yeah, the promiscuity, we're going to get to that. The amount of fornication that they have. Wickedness. Covetousness. Maliciousness. Oh, but the ones I know are all real nice. No, they're malicious. The Bible says they're filled with malicious, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. And that is a true statement. Anyone who knows these, these out and proud sodomites, they are haters of God. They hate God. Because they know the punishment that's coming to them. And they know that they're living in wickedness. And that's why their suicide rates are so high. That's why they're so sad. You know, they call themselves gay, but it's just a facade. Because they're not really gay. They're not really happy. They're miserable. Because they're wretches. Because they've rejected God. And now they're like an animal. And they know they're like a stinking animal. And they try to find happiness, and they can't. Because they've rejected God, and God has permanently rejected them. They're despiteful, proud. Yeah, that's, that's obvious. They're proud and boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers. We'll get to that as well. Remember that, covenant breakers. Because isn't that what they wanted? This is what the Supreme Court turned over and said, oh, now you're able to make, to have a marriage. And what's a marriage? It's a covenant right? A marriage is now, and, and you know, obviously they don't care about the meaning of the word marriage. They want to completely redefine it. They've already, you know, redefined it instead of being between a man and a woman, which is normal, which is right, which is what marriage is. They're applying it to, to just, just trying to change it. But not only that, they're covenant breakers. So the marriage is meaningless when you're a covenant breaker, when you just break your word, when you break your promises, and we'll get to that soon, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. You want to know what they're really like? They're un, they have no mercy. They're unmerciful. They are relentless. Which is why they've gotten to the point where they are now. One, because they're relentless. And two, because the, good, the, the godly man has failed. They've ceased. They've stopped talking. They've accepted it. And I'll tell you what, I'm sick of it. And I'm not going to just be polite around these homos. The Bible says in verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Not only they're doing all these things, but it actually makes them, they get their pleasure from everyone else that's doing them. They're trying to bring everyone down with them into their depraved, disgusting lifestyle. And that's why they recruit. They've been using this hashtag, you know, the President of the United States, Barack Hussein Obama, or Barry Sotero, you know, the bastard child, had this hashtag when he announced his, his backing of the Supreme Court's decision of love wins. But their gay marriage is not about love. We just saw the attributes. That's who they really are. They're haters of God. 
It's not about love. It's more about the devil's attack on the family and the family structure. And, God, and the devil knows that the family is a tight-knit group. And first he started attacking it through just getting people, getting divorced, you know, trying to, to raise the, the adultery and the fornication that is, that is just between normal people but with, with men and women. And he's, and he's done a good job with that when you look at the divorce rates and people who, who are not staying together. But it's nothing compared to the divorce rates and, the, and the, not even just divorce rates, but the, the promis promiscuity. It, it's, it's night and day when you compare it to the sodomites. The sodomites live a vile lifestyle. It's vile. It's disgusting and it's wicked. And the, and the reason why, if you, if you don't realize that, is because you don't know them that well. You might think you do, but you have no idea what goes on in secret among the sodomite community. They don't care about marriage. They live promiscuous lives because they have eyes that are full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. I have an excerpt today from the Family Research Council website that cites stats on homosexuals and their fidelity in relationships their ability to stay with one person. And I look, it disgusted me looking all this stuff up. I looked up some stats on my own. I actually went to lots and lots of places, resources, to try to find uh, studies and to try to find you know, what might be reliable, what's, what's considered reliable, what's not considered reliable. And this lines up with the Bibles. I know it's reliable. And... Not just that, this site, I was able to find a, a summary of, of multiple studies that have been done. So I'm going to read for you some of these results of these statistics from the homosexual community. And when we get through this, you'll realize they don't care about marriage. They don't care about, about sticking together with one person for life and that that's their true you know, partner that they're going to be married to and joined to for the rest of their life. And that, you know, when normal people make a wedding vow, when a man and woman make a wedding vow, it, they, they are given to each other solely, meaning no one else is involved. They're not going out and having relations with other people outside of their marriage. But let's look at some of these stats. Here's a quote that says, in, in the sexual organization of the city, University of Chicago sociologist Edward Lauman argues that typical gay city inhabitants spend most of their adult lives in transactional relationships or short-term commitments of less than six months. A study of homosexual men in the, in the Netherlands published in the journal AIDS found that the duration of steady partnerships was 1.5 years. In his study of male homosexuality and Western sexuality practice and precept in past and present times, Pollock found that few homosexual relationships last longer than two years, with many men reporting hundreds of lifetime partners. In male and female homosexuality, Sager and Robbins found that the average male homosexual live-in relationship lasts between two and three years. Research indicates that the average male homosexual has hundreds of sex partners in his lifetime. Hundreds. Hundreds of partners. Don't just read, don't just, just, just skip over that. Hundreds. That's a lot, multiple hundreds, not even one, one hundred's a lot. In a lifetime, the amount of promiscuity required, I mean, hundreds. It goes on, says the Dutch study of partnered homosexuals, which was published in the journal AIDS, found that men with a steady partner, so someone that they would consider their you know, significant other, and I'm sick of these stupid words that we have for, for these homos just to use, but um, 
It says those that had a steady partner had an average of eight partners per year. So they consider themselves in this relationship. Yeah, on average, they had eight people a year that they had relations with. Eight a year. And, and those are the ones that are supposedly had a steady partner. Bell and Weinberg, in their classic study of male and female homosexuality, found that 43% of white male homosexuals had intercourse with 500 or more partners, with 28% having 1,000 or more partners. A thousand. If you lied with a, a different person every single day, a different person, every day you're going to bed with somebody else, three years, every single day for three entire years, that's a thousand. That study found 28% had more than 1,000 partners. That is vile. That is disgusting. And think about this. 43% had 500 or more. 43%, that was almost half had 500 or more. You do not find anywhere near, anywhere near this amount of promiscuity amongst normal straight people. It doesn't happen. Now, is there fornication? Yes. Are there people who, who have slept around with different women or different men? Yes. But thousands? 500? In their study of the sexual profiles of 2,583 older homosexuals published in the journal, I don't even want to read this stuff, found that the modal, the modal range, now if you don't know what the modal range is, Mode, the mode of something is, what, is the, 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 what happens the most often. It's the frequency. So the, 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 the numbers that happen most frequently, most often, the modal range for the number of partners ever was 101 to 500. In this study of 2,583 people, the number that was most commonly reported fell in the range between 100 and 500. That was the most often. It says, in addition, 10.2% to 15.7% had between 501 and 1,000 partners. A further 10.2% to 15.7% reported having had more than 1,000 lifetime partners. That's what they're really like. This is what they're really about. You think people who live that type of prom promiscuous lifestyle care about marriage? No, what they consider it, they say it's, they, it has nothing to do with, with the physical act that, that happens between those perverts. They say it's, oh, it's, a, it's an emotional thing. So they could go out and, and do whatever they want with, with whoever they want, but they're still tied with that one person. And there's plenty of other statistics. I didn't want to get too far in depth into all the statistics because the Bible tells us what they're like anyways. This is just further proof from the statistics just to show you, just to, to, show, you, to show the naysayers that may not have the, the proper belief in the Bible. That no, this is what they're about. And this is what, you know, the great United States Supreme Court has ruled in favor of. Think about that. This Independence Day, which is coming up this week. 
right? Independence Day, the 4th of July. I was just out knocking doors yesterday and I already saw, you know, people decorating and it's God bless America, right? And, 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 and the flag waving how great the United States is. Can you even with a good conscience ask for God to bless a nation as wicked as ours has become. Can you think that you could say, hey, God bless this country when the country has just fallen into the depths of depravity and just openly endorses the vilest of men? When people are exalting the most depraved, like recently that perverted freak, Bruce Jenner, it turns my stomach, and you know what? It ought to turn your stomach, too. But the reason why it doesn't is because you've watched so much of the stinking television. You've seen so much of it. You had so much of it crammed down your throat that you know what? None of it seems to bother you anymore. I'll give you an example of this. This, this is how everybody is. When you allow... The wickedness to come in. When you allow it and you set it in front of your eyes, it affects you. You think it doesn't, but it does. I have completely forsaken the Hollywood movies and the TV shows and all that nonsense. I don't watch that stuff anymore and I haven't for many years. But when I did, I could think of, a, of a, oh, my own personal example with this. With, with this experience of this happening was with a movie, it was called, um, I think it was called American Beauty. And I believe it came out sometime in the late 90s with uh, Kevin Spacey and some other people, I don't know. And I remember going to see it at the movie theater and being very disturbed and walking out of that movie just, just kind of sick. Because it was sick. Because there was a lot of things that moved. Now back then, it was uh, things weren't as bad as they are even now when, in what they would show. But you have a grown man, you know, an adult, a middle-aged man, you know, in his 40s or whatever, lusting after his teenage daughter's teenage friend. And, and having these dreams and stuff. And, and it was portrayed in such a way as if it was really not that bad of a thing. Oh, he's just struggling. And oh, there's you know, all this stuff going on. And, and trying to show you how he loves her and all this. Just other, not, you know, when there's adultery going on. As if that's okay and that's normal and that's fine. And there's, you know, it's made light of the adultery that's going on. And then the homosexuality, the, the, the neighbor that comes over and, and, you know, and, and tries to kiss him and all this other stuff. Look, it was pure wickedness. And seeing that stuff on the screen way back then, I left that movie thinking like, man, like, that, was, that was disturbing. That was sick. I, I didn't enjoy it. But you know what? Over time, I ended up owning that movie. It's the desensitization. Because it wasn't just that one movie, it was every movie. Everything being put out. You see things and it shocks you at first. Then you see it again and it's not as much of a shock because you've already seen it before. Then you see it again and it starts to become more normal. It's the desensitization campaign of the Hollywood industry, of Satan himself. To destroy your morals, to destroy the family, and to get you accepting. And you know what? This is a new phenomenon within this country. But it's not new in history. The acceptance of homosexuality. People like to think, we're so progressive. Oh, we're so great. We're so smart. We're so loving. We're so tolerant. Oh, how great are we? Yeah, like the Romans were, like the Greeks were, like so many other great empires were. Yes, the, America, the United States is an empire. America has, has military all over the world. It's an empire. And we've risen to the heights now to where people are living decadent lives as they were back then. 
as the whole cycle of the of the of nations go, it seems. They rise to power, they have a lot of wealth, they fall into extreme wickedness and sin, and then they're destroyed. Where is the great Roman Empire now? The Greek Empire. It's history. But people are so ignorant today and so proud and think they know so much and think that they could just forsake God's laws and nothing's going to happen to them. They've got another thing coming. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 5. Because judgment always comes on the nation that exalts the wicked. Isaiah chapter 5. We start reading in verse number 18, Isaiah 5, 18. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. So he's saying, woe, you know, woe unto them that are drawing iniquity with, with cords of vanity, and as it were, a cart rope, like, like they're just pulling along their sin. So woe unto them that say, let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. And that's exactly what's happening today. People are trying to say, oh, the Sodomites, yeah, this is so good. Oh, this is great. Let's give them merit. Let's give them equal rights. Let's just exalt their lifestyle and say, hey, this is normal, and this is fine, and this is good. And they call good evil. And they're going to say, yeah, the Christian that believes the Bible is a hate monger. They're full of hate, and, and we need to get rid of them, and we need to, to make these, these hate laws, and we need to make this, you know, hate speech laws and everything else to get to silence them, because that's evil. They call that evil. They call good evil, and evil good. That put darkness for light, and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. They think they're so smart. and prudent in their own sight. Verse 22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. There are a lot of people who justify the wicked for reward. People get paid to endorse the homosexual community, and the people who, not only that, you think about the celebrities and the people who speak against the homos, what happens? There's a big backlash, right? From the, from the sodomite community and from those, the, the spiritual wickedness in high places that's going to come down on them and threaten them with losing their job, losing their income, losing their money. So what do they do? They justify the wicked for reward. They come back and they apologize. They say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't really mean that. The homos are just fine. I don't know what I was thinking because of reward. Because they don't want to lose their money. Woe unto them. Verse 24, Therefore, because of this, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their, their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. This has happened today. This has happened not just today, but, but in, ma in many of the recent years. Look, the nation as a whole has cast out God's laws. They love the grace part, but they've cast out God's laws. They want nothing to do with it. That's why the Ten Commandments aren't even allowed to be put up in a courthouse anymore, because they've cast out God's laws. They will have nothing to do with God's laws. But what happens as a result? Therefore... Is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people? Take that to heart. Against his people. God's anger is kindled. 
and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. You think that's bad is what this verse is saying? He's smitten his people. He said the hills did tremble. Their bodies, their carcasses were torn in the middle of the streets. Their bodies were torn apart. And even for all that, God's anger is still not turned away. Excuse me. But his hand is stretched out still. When you think, wow, that's really bad. That's enough. No. That's not it. Let's keep reading. Verse 26. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken, whose arrows are sharp, and all their bows bent. Their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. God brings his judgment on the wicked. The examples I brought up, the Greeks, the Romans, they were defeated. They were destroyed by an enemy. God's going to bring an enemy, I believe, completely on this country and destroy this country. It's going to happen. Because that's always the way that God has dealt with the proud nations, with the nations that have turned their back on God, that have gone and worshipped and served idols instead of the true and living God. The nations that have had God exalted and who followed His laws, when they forsake His laws, when they forsake His ways, when they exalt the, the, the vilest of men, the wicked are everywhere. They're on every side. Because when the exalted is lifted up high, that emboldens people to be more wicked. They say, hey, people like this, I'm going to get even more wicked and get more, you know, and then it's going to become more accepted and it snowballs out of control. We think about Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not just some Old Testament Bible story that doesn't apply to us in the New Testament today because that's what people, oh, yeah, Sodom, yeah, that was the Old Testament, oh, yeah. That those things all happened a long time ago, but that's not, you know, we're, we're in the days of, you know, Jesus Christ and, and, you know, God has forgiveness. And, you know, look, God has always had forgiveness. People are always saved by grace through faith. But the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was recorded in God's holy word, in his preserved word, for a reason for us today. In 2 Peter 2, 6, the Bible says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample. They're an example unto those that after should live ungodly. This was written in the New Testament, saying, look, Sodom and Gomorrah, their wicked sin, their, their disgusting, vile, reprobate acts, and their cities being turned into ashes, being destroyed for, with fire and brimstone from heaven. It was done to serve a purpose so that you people living later, you people here in the New Testament, it's an example for those after that would want to live ungodly and follow in the ways of Sodom. Sodomy's not new. Sodomy comes from Sodom. That's where the name comes from. Sodom is a really, really old city that was around a long time ago. People exalted Sodomites then. The whole city was given over to it. They loved it. They had no problem with it. They accepted it. And God rained fire and brimstone down from heaven and destroyed it. Jude 7, verse 7 says, Jude verse 7 reads, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, and another word for strange is queer, strange flesh are set forth for an example, 
suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So go ahead and post your love wins because you know what? You know what ultimately wins? God wins. That's not love. It's perversion. And shame on you if you're supporting perversion. God's anger is going to be against you. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Because most people, you know, I, I know I'm preaching to people right now who don't have this soft spot for the homosexuality. But when things like this happen, they need, they need to be addressed. But here's the, the, the main purpose for preaching this this morning. To people who are, I already know that the Sodomites are wicked. I know that they're perverted. Okay. What are you doing to stem that tide? Do you just accept things? Do you just tolerate it? Do you just, just allow it? Or are you going to speak up and speak, speak out against the perversion and let other people know that I think this is wicked. I think this is an abomination. I think it's disgusting. I think it turns my stomach and I don't want to be around it. And shame on you, homo. You go back in the closet because I don't want to see your wickedness being flaunted in front of everybody and especially in front of my children. Matthew 5, look at verse 11, because we need to be edified this morning. We need to be strengthened. Look, there are a lot of enemies. There are a lot of adversaries, and they're going to try to attack you and try to get you to shut up so they can continue on marching forward with their disgusting, perverted agenda to defeat the family. Don't just sit back and take it. Verse 11, Matthew 5, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you, and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. Be happy about it. Don't get upset about it. Be happy when, when men are reviling you and cursing you because of your stand for, for the Lord, for, for Jesus' sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. Christian, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth, thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. If you're not going to be that salt to preserve the righteousness, you're good for nothing. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, not in secret, not in your house, not just among your family, before men. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We need to let our light, and what's the light that's in us? It's Jesus Christ. The light is from God's Word. Jesus Christ is the Word. God's law is part of that Word. The righteousness, the holiness of God, that light needs to be shined and needs to be proclaimed. Don't hide that light just because people may revile you, just because people may despise you. Jesus Christ himself, these are all the words of Christ in verse 17, says, Think not 
that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. He didn't come to destroy the law. He didn't come to negate what the prophets have said. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Has heaven and earth passed? Don't tell me we're in the New Testament and age of grace and that the, the Old Testament laws don't apply anymore. Sin still exists. Sin is the transgression of the law. You cannot have sin if you don't have the law. God's law exists. God created His laws for very good reasons. Judgment is coming on this nation. But, O oh Christian, you need to let your light shine. And you need to stand up against this, this growing tide of people who are just embracing perversion. Someone needs to speak up and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We are not going to stand for this, this disgusting behavior. And I'm going to speak out against it in public when I see it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your pure words, dear Lord, your words that you have preserved for us today in 2015. God, I pray that you would please help as, as help our, our Christian community, dear Lord, people who actually love you and care about you, to be more vocal to grow a spine, to stand up for what's right. Lord, we live in the midst of a, of a crooked and perverse nation, dear God, and I pray that you would please just strengthen the brethren, strengthen the saints, dear Lord. It's a shame what's, what's happened so quickly in this country, dear God. We know that judgment is coming. We also know that you're able to, to preserve the just and, and to, to keep us from that hour of, of judgment, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please do that, but help us along the way to, to convert sinners and to, and to convert people to you, dear Lord. I pray that you would please strengthen this church and, um, Lord, help us to be a lighthouse, to be a beacon and a light shining in a, in a very dark, disturbed world, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.